So I want to just um, take the opportunity to welcome everyone to our very first session to the ASCO Clinical Research eCourse. Um, this has been organized in collaboration with BioVentures and Global Health and also the Centre Hospitalité Universitaire of uh, Trekville in Côte d'Ivoire. I uh, want to welcome everyone. Um, we are very excited to have participants from all over, um, in particular um, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Cameroon, Rwanda, and uh, we have speakers and presenters uh, from um, other areas in Africa as well, um, including and then Canada, France. Um, we truly have an international uh, representation uh, among our uh, faculty and um, our presenters. So um, we're really excited to be able to offer this program for everyone. Um, we hope that um, everyone has gotten the information that they need uh, to successfully um, access some of the um, pre-work and the um, things that will be uh, provided along the way for the participants. Um, we, for example, I think um, a few of you have um, submitted your um, ASCO IDs for us to be able to give you access to our fundamentals course. Um, it's an online course um, that's typically, um, you normally have to pay for this, but, uh, but for, through this course, we're able to offer it for free. Um, all you need is an ASCO ID. Membership is not required. So, um, so if you could please, um, if you haven't signed up already, uh, go ahead and sign up, get your ASCO ID. It's a series of numbers. Um, you can send it to us and we will get you your access to those uh, modules. So um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, if your bandwidth allows, it'd be great if you could share your video. Um, if, if you have some connection issues or you're not able to, then that's fine, um, we understand. Um, and if you want to speak, um, please unmute your line. Um, if you're on the phone, that would be star six. Um, and then if you have questions along the way, we do have discussion times built in after each presentation. Um, you can go ahead, unmute yourself and, and go ahead and, and uh, ask your questions. You can also use the chat feature. Um, you can also use the raise hand feature um, on Zoom. So any of those ways um, you can communicate uh, your questions to us and we'll make sure that they are answered by the presenters. So if you need any technical assistance during the session, um, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, my name is Vanessa. Um, Samira um, from BBGH is also on the call and she's available to help. Um, we also have any of the ASCO staff, um, Megan and Vanessa Sarche, um, Donna Rollins, um, any of those people are able to assist as well. Um, if you need any email assistance, um, we do have um, international at ASCO.org, or you can just um, go ahead and reply to the emails, one of the emails that I've sent to you over the last few weeks. Um, we are offering a certificate of completion for this program. So we have six sessions um, in this program. If you uh, participate in at least five of them, uh, you will get a certificate. Um, one of the requirements for that as well is that you complete the pre-survey uh, and the post-survey. So you, we've um, sent you a link to a survey that we wanted to, you to fill out before the course. Um, I think most of you probably have already, but if you haven't, um, there's still some time if you uh, want to go back and, and uh, complete that survey. If you have any um, reason you need to be um, away and you're not able to participate in one of the sessions, please feel free to uh, send us an email and let us know. So um, one of the Things that has come up is just um, we're wondering about the best form of communication. So if you um, are able to get email, um, that's usually how we're communicating with people. Um, if you would prefer to get a message through WhatsApp, um, please let us know and um, provide your telephone number and we'll start a WhatsApp group uh, for, for people who find it more convenient 
to um, com communicate in this way. So um, this is an overview of what we're going to be covering today. Um, this is, um, of course, the housekeeping part, and I'm Vanessa Eaton I'm with ASCO. I'm our, our Director of International Education. Um, then we'll have a little bit of an overview of the course, um, and we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Philippe Autier um, give some information about epidemiology studies. And then we'll be doing some discussions, some breakout discussions, um, followed by our research presentation by Dr. Joseph um, from Nigeria, and, um, and followed by some closing remarks. If you have any questions along the way, please feel free to reach out to me. So really happy to have our faculty here. Um, Dr. Ian Tanik is our course director. Um, he's uh, formerly uh, from Princess Mar Margaret Hospital in Canada. Um, now I guess he's working in, uh, in somewhere in the, the remote, um, remote Canada now, uh, which is great. And uh, so he's our course director um, for this time and he's also facilitating our session. Um, we have Dr. Philippe Autier, who's from the International Prevention Research Institute in France, who will be presenting with us and Dr. Adedayo Joseph from the Lagos uh, University Teaching Hospital in Nigeria. She'll be presenting on some of her research activities. So without further ado, please, Dr. Tanik, go ahead. Ah, thank you, Vanessa. Et bonjour à tous. Uh, je sais bien que la langue préférée de, de la plupart parmi vous, c'est uh, français. Uh, et je pourrais uh, parler un peu en français pour l'introduction. Can we have the next slide, Vanessa, please? Donc, uh, le but de ce cours, c'est d'améliorer uh, la compréhension uh, des uh, sujets uh, suivants. Uh, comment uh, faire les études épidémiologiques? C'est la session d'aujourd'hui. Comment évaluer la littérature médicale et evidence-based medicine, c'est le même en français et en anglais. Euh, comment faire une comparaison avec les résultats des essais cliniques? Euh, c'est différent que les résultats qu'on peut voir dans les cliniques, dans vos cliniques. Comment stimuler euh, la diagnostic précoce? Comment améliorer la palliation? Et enfin, comment travailler avec les laboratoires euh, pour euh, faire de la recherche dans le développement euh, des drogues? Et donc, euh, Uh, on ne veut pas gaspiller uh, plus de temps et on va commencer avec uh, la présentation de Philippe Autier. Philippe est uh, belgique, uh, mais il travaille à Lyon, en France. Il est uh, vice-président uh, de qu -ce que International Prevention Research Institute. Philippe, à toi. OK. Merci, Ian. Merci. Um, Vanessa, uh, j just one question, and I am too. Uh, do I present in French or in uh, English at, uh, or, or in Dutch or in Spanish? No. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, what, what would be because... ce qui est plus confortable. OK. Uh, for me, it's really uh, the same. I mean, my slides are in English, but uh, I'm going to share my uh, my screen now. Uh, okay. Uh, Je pense c'est parfait si uh, si tu parles en, en français, mais les diapositives sont en anglais. Uh. Yeah, but uh, probably the best is that if someone doesn't understand what I say in English, please ask uh, or just get give an answer. Uh, a question during the chat it's probably better because it's okay I'm, I'm, okay do you see my screen not yet oh no not yet mm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Share. Okay. Okay. Now it's coming. Thank you. Yep. Is that you see it? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. So we'll. Uh, yeah, that's it. Also, we will have a, a say a, a quick overview of uh, what epidemiological study is, what, what it means, uh, and try as much as possible to uh, to uh, focus in the context of uh, Africa. Uh, and uh, and in fact, uh, the, we can summarize and have a definition of epidemiology which is the science of disease occurrence, why disease do occur at all, why we have a disease, why in some person, not in other, why in older, not in younger, so all these questions of the disease occurrence, disease course, why some uh, are healed, why some die from the disease, and indeed the patient outcome, which is uh, uh, which in includes many other uh, aspects than just the dying, also the quality of life, things like that. So in fact, uh, I've tried to, uh, to just to make a, a kind of classification, rough classification of the epidemiological studies, uh, starting with what we call generally the descriptive studies, where descriptive studies are uh, just for, say, describing what's going on in the population, what's going on in the uh, geographic area, and, and so on. And uh, this is uh, the, the first type of study. Then we have prediction studies, which are those studies where we are really uh, uh, focused and concentrating of the survival of patients and factors are affecting survival. These studies indeed are quite important, important in, the, in the cancer field. Then we have the etiologic studies. Etiologic studies are, are uh, hypothesis generating for finding out the likely cause of disease occurrence and of death. Indeed, all is about finding out the causes of cancer or why people die from a cancer. And then we have the intervention studies for which you will have other sessions after, but I will uh, a little bit go over that, which is generally verification of cause effect relationship. That's to say, you, you know there is a factor or a drug that may uh, uh, alter the benefit to the patient, and you want to test whether this is true. And so you organize interventions to this. But you will see that there are probably different ways of looking at intervention studies. Okay, so one very important thing in, uh, in epidemiology is that uh, difference with the, uh, the, the, say, the clinical practice. In clinical practice, the unit is the patient. You see patient uh, one, patient two, and so on and so on. In epidemiology, you have the patient and the, the population from which patient arise. So you have always in epidemiology the two dimensions. One are the patients, the other is population. And they are always related to, to each other. We, that, that's, we are constantly do, doing that. And one way to uh, to, uh, to to put to, to put together the the patient and the population is what we call the rate of disease, which is very basically the number of patients divided by the total population, from which we can have a number of patients per generally one thousand or one hundred thousand subjects. So this is a way we we work in epidemiology is always by rates. Uh, the rate is really our uh, uh, basic mathematical uh, expression. And, uh, and in fact, epidemiological studies can be done uh, virtually in every place uh, you, you could imagine. Uh, so starting, uh, we have two basic parameters for uh, the, the epidemiology. And uh, these two parameters have, are, have really to be uh, really taught when uh, starting writing a protocol or thinking of, about uh, a study. And these are the prevalence or the incidence of a disease. So the first uh, about the prevalence of a disease is in fact the number of subjects in the population who have the disease at a certain time. So just to say how many patients uh, in, uh, in my country in 2020 had uh, lung cancer, for instance. I just uh, put that uh, the example here. And in fact, it's just a question of dividing the 2020 by those population, then we stress that by 1,000 subjects, and we had 1.8 patients with lung cancer per 1,000 subjects in 2020. So the prevalence is a kind of cross-sectional, cross-cutting type of parameter of, uh, of, of disease uh, in a population. Uh, 
uh, and this is very, uh, the prevalence is very important, very interesting, because it tells you a lot about the resources needed for uh, dealing with the disease. The, the, the greater the prevalence, the greater uh, the, the resource needed for dealing with the disease. Then you have the other, which is the incidence. And the incidence is very different from the prevalence, and the incidence consists of the number of subjects that are newly diagnosed with the disease. So here we take into consideration the fact that the, these are new diagnoses. So we don't care about those who were diagnosed in the past, whereas in the prevalence, we take we, we, the prevalence takes into consideration those patients that have been also uh, uh, diagnosed in the past that are still uh, living in the population. So the incidence is really about the new cases of patients. And typically, uh, for instance, during a year, we have 30 patients diagnosed with lung cancer, newly diagnosed. So the incidence is, uh, again, here, uh, uh, 25 new cases of lung cancer per 100,000 subjects. So that's the way, in general, uh, we, 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 we present that. that. So you will see this kind of, uh, sometimes, of unit in papers, in, uh, in articles, which is the way to, uh, to present the data in a, in an abbreviation, abbreviated way, if you wish, 25 new cases of lung cancer per 100,000 subjects is in fact 25 per 10 PYs. So that's a way to, to express, and that's a usual unit for the incident. So the distinction here is always to be very clear, clearly uh, uh, taught uh, before uh, anything else. So, uh, <clears throat> Here I come to the, 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 the most important thing in epidemiologic health studies are designs. Designs mean uh, the, it's a study, the architecture of a study, uh, the different pieces of methodology that need to be put together in order to answer to a main question. Uh, so you have to, to, to what is the, the, the sample, which, which patient I need to select, uh, where, where are the patients, exactly how to define the disease, uh, how I'm going to measure the exposure, or I'm going to assess the outcome. All these are the different parts you will need to uh, address when writing a protocol for, uh, for a study. And here we come directly to that architecture, which is the, what we call the study design. And in fact, uh, what is important is that the interpretation of epidemiological studies rests on designs. By the way, it's not only of epidemiological studies, uh, it's also from, uh, you will see it's the same for clinical trials, clinical studies, whatever. It is the design that gives the, the, the raison d'etre and, uh, and the way to interpret the results. It's not the statistics. That's something you have absolutely to, uh, to bear in mind always, is that the statistics, they have a minor role finally in all, uh, in all the, 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 the way to, to look at the uh, results of a study. What is important is the architecture because because of the architecture that you can decide whether it's just an association you observe or whether there is a cause effect or whether we are sure that evidence-based we can affect the disease course because uh, we have sufficient uh, causal uh, evidence. Uh, so design indeed uh, is uh, something that is not always that robust. Uh, it's prone to bias, what we call these strange bees, which is bias. And you will hear that all over the all over, all over the play, which are in fact errors in their architecture, uh, and these biases are likely to distort results. Uh, this is generally uh, difficult to unbiased epidemiological studies are very 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 rare. Uh, uh, you have to always to bear in mind that uh, the biases are something that are uh, was around and may explain bizarre results or uh, essentially. Uh, 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 sometimes. So, uh, the pro so what, is, what is critical for you is that at the time of protocol writing, it's important to think about, okay, when I have a design, what are the likely source of error in my result? And this is something, uh, what are the methodological problems that uh, I, I have to take care of so that uh, I minimize the number of errors from, say, the study I'm, I'm doing, that I have the result that are really uh, uh, Closer, closest to the, 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 the reality. So this is the, the, the design that makes really the, the, the important thing. Uh, in epidemiological research, time is a key parameter. And time, why? Because uh, uh, if we look at, uh, say, 
the, the, the thinking of uh, invading cause effect relationships between some factor and exposure, uh, we call exposure and a disease. Uh, is there a cause and effect? We can only uh, uh, talk, talk about the cause, talk about the cause effect if and only if there is a time interval between the exposure and the disease, and that the exposure precedes the disease. Uh, so the exposure and disease time. Uh, smoke, smoking well uh, years before you get the lung cancer. Of course, that's the, the one very uh, usual, uh, uh, very usual uh, relationship, causal relationship. Of course, you will tell me, well, that's not rocket science to have just an exposure before disease and to have time in between and so on. In fact, uh, all the experience shows that it's sometimes the most difficult thing to do in epidemiological research is to really have a good idea of the time relationship between events, exposure and outcomes and of, and of other factors. This is something that uh, can pose a lot of, uh, of issues. And uh, although it looks simple, it's sometimes one of the most complicated thing to, uh, uh, to, to address when reading a paper or when writing a protocol. Uh, the same for, for the prediction, if you are looking at survival uh, or uh, the outcome, we also, we have always to have that, uh, uh, be sure of uh, that uh, time relationship between uh, a factor, presence of a factor and then the outcome la later on. And so that's a uh, key, key, key aspect. Then there is uh, another uh, uh, potentially misleading uh, say a parameter in, uh, in epidemiology, which is confounding. And confounding, uh, in fact, is uh, within the causal pathway. When you try, you try to think about causality. But in fact, the confounding factor is a, con it's a factor that is uh, associated with both the exposure and the disease. And in fact, uh, the confounding factor may distort and uh, just uh, tweak the, the, the link between the exposure and the disease. For instance, I can take a very simple example of a potential confounding factor is age. This is a very frequent confounding factor. You are comparing two different populations. One population that is exposed to, say, uh, a lot of uh, uh, smoking, for instance, and then you find there is not much of a lung cancer. Whereas in another country where smoking is much less prevalent, you have much, much more, uh, many more uh, lung cancer, apparently. So you say, why is there such a difference? I would think that uh, where smoking is highly prevalent, there would be more lung cancer. And in fact, you just look at the age structure, it may be that where you have uh, less smoking, in fact, uh, the, the, the age of uh, uh, people is much, much older, much, much uh, younger, which explains, sorry, much younger, which explains that you have less uh, lung cancer in. Uh, you can have this kind of distortion brought by uh, uh, age differences. And so most usual confounding factors are age, sex, place of residence. So sometimes socioeconomic status, things like that. But these are very, the very frequent type of, uh, of confounding factors. So there are two ways uh, to, to avoid these confounding factors. Uh, one, in epidemiology STD, we, we have the multivariable statistical analysis that works very well if and only if, if you have the data on confounding factors. So it mean, means that you have in your protocol to be sure that you, you got all the data on these potential confounding factors so that you can uh, control them at the time of data analysis. Then no, the other good way to, uh, to control for confounding and that will come in your next sessions is a randomized control trial. Randomization is something magnificent. It's a miraculous invention in that it uh, distributes the confounding factor equally between the intervention group and the control group. So that's, this is why uh, randomization is so uh, remarkable in that it uh, distributes the confounding factors. And you may ignore the confounding factors in randomized, right? You don't care of knowing the confounding factors because of randomization, there are equally distributed, even though you don't know which, what the confounding factors are. And this is remarkable in the, in the say, the development of science in human beings. So have invented a way for avoiding all these confounding. In traditional, more traditional epidemiology, in uh, population epidemiology and so on, 
we try to do our best to identify potential confounding factors and have the data on them so that we can control them at the time of analysis or sometimes also during the design. I will come back to that later. So coming to the descriptive studies, uh, these are extremely important, I would say, in a setting uh, like uh, Africa, where I've used to, to work for quite a number of years. And uh, why? Because the descriptive studies give you an overview, a good overview of what's going on uh, uh, in your uh, setting, be it hospital, a population, a village, a city, whatever. And uh, this is the basic, I would say, of any epidemiologist to have, to be, uh, to have a, 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 an excellent uh, approach in descriptive epidemiology. And I think that today we'll have a, a presentation with kind of descriptive epidemiology. Descriptive studies are about earth activities, the outputs, that's the service the, to, the, to the patients and the outcomes, uh, the number of dead, the number, just simply uh, what happens, nothing, nothing more. And then we have these, uh, these kind of uh, descriptive studies. Then we have the ecological studies or correlation studies. Um, so the cross-sectional studies are part of all these things. And in fact, what we try to do with the ecological studies just generate to have a, a, to correlate different factors between them and see whether there is a statistical association or not between these factors. And then we have the, the, the burden of disease to these that to say, okay, what is the, the burden of disease? What how do they affect the health of population and mortality, uh, which resources uh, the economic cost, things like that, all these burden of disease studies. Uh, these descriptive uh, studies are extremely important for management. And, uh, we generally, uh, that's basic role. Unfortunately, they tell you nothing about cause-effect relationship. Uh, so a descriptive study will never uh, be able to assess whether there is a cause-effect relationship between an exposure and, say, uh, uh, an outcome or a disease, occurrence, the occurrence of a disease. Uh, all these correlation, all these uh, even even though you would have many p-values and things like that, they will never be tell you not, nothing about the, 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 the cause effect. Why? And typically it's because of this. The descriptive studies are enabled to really set the time relationship between the exposure or factors and the outcomes. That's something, uh, disease and outcomes. This is something quite uh, typical from these descriptive studies. So very important studies for management, but be, beware are not, not uh, uh, able to, to, to uh, provide hints about the cause effect relationship. Then we have the prediction studies with survival studies with the, the long-term and short long-term outcome. And indeed there are many uh, uh, kind, kind of outcomes we can look at uh, with the survival studies. It's a strange name, survival for, but for oops, what is that that I'm doing? Sorry, yes. Uh, uh, where we can look at the number of, uh, of, uh, of outcomes after uh, a disease a patient has been treated. Can be, of course, the, the survival, RAF3 survival for cancer is one, but there are other quite important uh, other outcomes that need to be, to be I think, uh, more, more attention, like the quality of life, the return to work, ability to take care of family, that these are important or come in, in what we would call that the survival uh, studies. And then indeed the survival studies try to look at the concomitant factors they may affect survival, age, sex, stage, therapies received, comorbidities, socioeconomic status, and so on and so on. And just some, some examples. And indeed, uh, other uh, survival studies are based on the clinical, clinical and pathological factors and the stage, the, the, the biology of the tumors, uh, many of these parameters. So all these enter in that class of survival studies. Then after we have the fourth, the third big group, which are the etiological studies. And there we have two main designs. One, one uh, important design is the, uh, are the etiological uh, studies, uh, the case control studies, sorry. I will take a little bit more time for explaining what it is about. Um, sorry. 
very, very sensitive. Uh, what case controls do we try aim at is, in fact, to, to they want to look at the exposure, the past exposure of subjects who have been diagnosed with a disease, and they compare the exposure to some factor, they compare that with the exposure of subjects who don't have the disease. So subject with the disease, take women who have a breast cancer, for instance, subject without disease, woman free, with no breast cancer, and retrospectively, so look in the past with questionnaires, you ask women, did you, for instance, have children? Did you uh, have a, a long breastfeeding? Uh, did you uh, have a surgery beforehand for benign uh, breast disease and so on? So these are the things you are looking at retrospectively. And, uh, and so you start from the disease, uh, the patient themselves, and then looking at subject with the disease, the controls, if you wish. And so this is, uh, and indeed what you look at is whether there is a difference in the uh, probability of having been exposed to that factor, to a factor in the past. That's what we compare. So you compare the two groups. And this comparison may tell you, oh, yes, that's right. And, and I would say there are many, many good uh, case control studies that have been done in the 80s and 90s informing on some very important uh, key uh, risk factors for uh, common, uh, uh, for very common uh, cancer like breast cancer, brain cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, and others. And, and this is quite uh, an interesting uh, design to adopt uh, when you are, say, in a kind of hospital setting. And, I, and one of the articles uh, today uh, is about uh, this, the use of these case control, uh, case control studies. Uh, so one, one thing, though, that you, that's difficult, that bit difficult with the case control studies, the most difficult aspect of case control studies is to find out a suitable group of control subjects. Uh, is by far the most uh, difficult uh, issue. Why? One, one, one reason for the difficulty of finding a control subject without the disease is that they are much less motivated than the, the people suffering from the disease. When you ask people suffering from disease, would you like to participate to a study for understanding? Generally, they accept, they are quite uh, keen to accept. But when you ask people who are healthy and who have, don't have the disease, would you like to participate to or answer to a questionnaire? Things might be much more difficult. And because of that, uh, generally, uh, having uh, the, the, the control, uh, control group might be uh, quite a selection of people more eager to participate. And that's just a bias. You see, it's a bias, selection bias of the control group. That might uh, affect the, 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 the great key result. So when, when the so case control study is very, very attractive. Uh, it's, uh, it, can, it can be done without too much uh, uh, money, but it's not, uh, it's not that difficult to organize, but, but be careful on one thing is the control group, avoiding the selection bias, avoiding having people just uh, uh, accepting to, to be in the study, uh, but uh, that they're probably not representative of the, uh, the, the real the old population of women not having of people free of, of the, 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 the disease. Okay, then, then you have the, the second major design in etiological studies, the core studies, core studies, where in fact it's practically the reverse of the, 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 the case control studies, where in fact you start with a big population, say big, try to have it big, it's better, uh, of of people who have uh, individuals in a population. And these individuals from the start, they, are, they don't have a disease. They, you say you are looking at, again, I take the example of breast cancer. You want to understand the, 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 causal, the causal factors that increase the risk of breast cancer among women. And then for that, typically, you will take a huge uh, number of women that are free of breast cancer. They don't have uh, breast cancer. And then uh, you will follow them over time for a number of years. Typically, it takes years. And uh, you will uh, so then, from the beginning on, you have questionnaire, you have uh, blood samples, 
And you know who, who are the women who have been exposed to some, uh, say, drugs or having children, uh, married, not married, things like that. And uh, these are factory, yes, factory. And then you follow the, these women. Then some women uh, will develop a breast cancer and some other uh, uh, so women who develop the breast cancer, some of them will be exposed to the factor and some other will not be exposed to the factor. And so that cohort will essentially look at the incidence of breast cancer uh, uh, and look at the incidence according to past exposure uh, to these factors. So here we are in a kind of longitudinal setting, we look forward and we try to know prospectively whether uh, we have an association between uh, a factor and uh, the, the disease. This, this, this design is more complicated to run and more expensive in general than the, the case controls to this, but it's far more robust, it's less prone to bias. So this is uh, something always to consider. Uh, when, uh, but it's longer to organize and uh, to, uh, to, to, to get money funding. Uh, then lastly, the, the intervention studies. Intervention studies, you will, you will certainly uh, learn a lot about randomized trials in, in next sessions. But I wanted to uh, uh, just to mention that Interventions, these are not only the randomized control trial or the placebo control or something like that. It's uh, in fact, uh, we have, uh, 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 which is by, by definition, the design less prone to bias and confounding, which is, let's say this, uh, it's a miraculous uh, type of, uh, of, of design. And we have interventions, these that we call quasi experiment. Quasi experiment, why? Because here the, the, the randomization is not between individual, individual that will randomize in one group with a drug or individual in a group with say a placebo. Here we, the randomization unit are groups of people, clusters. Could be villages, could be areas in cities and so on. And many good publications uh, down uh, like the one we, we, we have uh, supervised in Mumbai on breast cancer uh, screening uh, with, uh, with IAN and, and, and many other are based on this kind of approach of uh, randomizing clusters. The randomization of clusters has a number of, um, say, drawbacks, limitation, but one good thing with the clusters is that it makes many studies possible in difficult settings. So that's a, it's always a trade-off between, say, the practicality and, uh, say, the, uh, uh, the ideal world of uh, individual randomization. So, it's something, uh, the quasi-experimentation is a uh, uh, design that was uh, make, make uh, attract uh, more and more attention at this moment. And then we have the natural experiments. And the natural experiments are something we, as epidemiologists, like, we, we are very uh, uh, keen to look at these natural experiments uh, because you have in many, in our world, you have many uh, populations that are naturally or exposed naturally, when I say naturally, it's because of, the, because of the environment, but because also of human activity or because of health activities. And this exposure occurs all the time. And indeed, it's uh, quite interesting to, uh, to, uh, to examine how disease and outcomes uh, compare between those who have been ex exposed naturally to some exposure or health activity to other countries or areas where you didn't have that activity. I show you an example of that because for time I, I couldn't show too many, too many examples for everything, but it's just an example here of this kind of natural experiment. And this is a, a paper published uh, 30 years ago in 86 in The Lancet, not, good, not a bad journal. And uh, what did that paper, they, they, these were, this is based on cancer registries in Nordic countries, as you may know. Uh, Nordic countries have a long-standing experience of very high quality uh, cancer registries where they collect standard data on uh, cancer that have been diagnosed in, in the Nordic countries, in Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden. And, uh, and this is start, oh yes, the, the graph here, in fact, uh, this is start in the early 60s, so just to say it's quite uh, uh, very long ago. And, uh, and uh, 
what this graph shows is the incidence rate of cervical cancer on cervical cancer. And uh, you have here the, the incidence rate of cervical cancer for year by year for these four countries. And in fact, in Nordic countries, there are two countries, uh, which are Finland and, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, so Sweden, sorry. We have introduced pap, pap screening very early in the 60s here, in the 60s. Whereas Norway and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, Denmark, they, they decided not to introduce it too early. They, they prefer to wait uh, some years. And what, you, you, what happened is that the, the, the mortality from uh, cervical cancer dropped very quickly in uh, those countries that had launched uh, uh, sorry, that had launched screening uh, in the 60s. Then after, two other countries started screening themselves and then the, uh, there was a, say, uh, which encouraged also the decrease in the mortality from cervical cancer. But you see here, for instance, Finland, these three countries, it's quite clear that uh, uh, where screening has been uh, 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 become uh, uh, wider spread, then the, the, the mortality has decreased much more. For 30 years, this has represented the best evidence uh, that uh, uh, cervical cancer screening was working effectively, cause effect, it was considered as such. And this is a pure uh, natural, let's say, naturality cause experiment um, observation. And this is done with cancer registries, and this is done with uh, good knowledge of health activities. So it may, and there are examples of uh, these kind of thing in the, this kind of natural experience and many other settings. Those, this is quite interesting also uh, to, to observe, to, uh, to take into consideration. So if with all these designs I've just presented to you, in a very summarized, there are indeed differences uh, in many aspects between the, these, uh, these designs. And uh, uh, just to start, let's see what these are. Oops. The design in the, uh, uh, you have there on the, the uh, left hand side of, uh, of the slide. And in generally, the data type, the data that are used for the design can be individual or general population, uh, general uh, population groups. And indeed, for etiological studies and randomized control trials, it's always the individual data that matters. If you don't have individual data, it's very difficult to perform this kind of. of Whereas for descriptive studies, some often it's done at the group level. Indeed, as I said before, time relationship is generally impossible with the, uh, with the descriptive, impossible at least. You, you can, be, uh, can, be really, can be very misleading uh, when you don't have the, the appropriate design. Survival studies, indeed, you must have a, a, a time relationship for uh, assessing survival. In the etiological studies, the case control, in general, you have a, a time relationship, but you must be careful on uh, being sure there is a real time relationship. Cohort studies, generally you have a, a good time relationship. And indeed, the uh, randomized trial, this is uh, very powerful in terms of uh, having a time relationship uh, with these trials. The biases, yes, uh, be careful. The ecological studies where you just compare uh, two groups or individuals, uh, or uh, characteristics among individuals, uh, they are very, very prone to biases. Uh, you may make a number of mistakes uh, with these kind of, uh, of studies. Case control studies also can be dangerous, essentially because of the, de the difficulty to have a suitable uh, control group that is really comparable to the, the group of patients who have the disease. Um, Randomized trial are the less prone to, to, to bias. Confounding, it's about the same story, uh, where we have always to be careful with the, uh, uh, with the different uh, designs. By definition, uh, the confounding is practically impossible to really fall in the descriptive, uh, descriptive studies. Whereas with the, these uh, ecological stu etiological studies, uh, you, the statistical methods may help you greatly, provided that you have the, 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 the right data, that you have collected data on these confounding uh, factors. So for the cause effect, never with the descriptive studies. 
And then here, this is a rule, I would say, a rule of thumb, as uh, many like to, to put it. Uh, when dealing with case control studies and you find a result, generally don't trust the result of a risk, say, are people at greater risk when they have been exposed to a factor as compared to people who have never been exposed to that factor, okay? Generally, you must find a risk of three or more, that to say 300% times more ch chance of getting the disease as compared to those who have never been exposed. Uh, you need to have a loss ratio relative risk greater than three for saying that probably you have something that can be uh, uh, in for uh, cause effect relationship. For cohort studies, you need at least to have two. Below these, these numbers, below this risk level, in general, when you're in the, the, the range of 1.2, 1.3, 1 1.5, you should be extremely careful with these observational studies. In general, it's probably more the role of confounding that is uh, playing a role there. So these studies are, say, trustable and the, the, the findings are really relatively, relatively high. Otherwise, it's only with the randomized trial that you can try to have, I'll say, 20% decrease uh, of uh, mortality thanks to a drug is something uh, incredibly interesting, but you need to have these randomized trial to assess it. That's uh, impossible otherwise. Um, then, and here I'm coming to, uh, to the, uh, uh, somewhat to the end of my presentation. And I would like to insist on uh, this, uh, this aspect of cancer registration. Uh, cancer registration is the systematic and standardized uh, collection of data on patients diagnosed with a malignancy, say invasive cancer, borderline, cytotactable, with tumoral disease, I would say, not only invasive cancer. And in fact, uh, these, uh, the activity around cancer registration, being in hospital, being in the country, being in the region and so on, is extremely valuable and is, say, the, the basic uh, molecule for uh, conducting and thinking of conducting uh, good uh, uh, epidemiological studies uh, anywhere. I would say. Uh, difficult to have a good epidemiology on, of cancer without having proper re registration of uh, cancer diagnosed within a population, even of patients within a hospital. So the setting is important indeed, but wherever there is an activity on the uh, management of cancer patient, there should always be a registry collecting data on a standard way. Uh, of course, one prerequisite is to have uh, good uh, diagnosis and staging uh, capabilities, uh, but most, most of you probably work in uh, this, this kind of setting. And uh, in general, of course, it's administratively it can be a bit cumbersome. I say, okay, you collect data, data, but can tell you that on the long term, it pays off. Uh, it means that at some point in time, you will have a lot of data, you know what you are doing. And in any way, uh, uh, this is uh, really, uh, I, 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 I heard you to look for in Sanda IARC, where I have worked for a number of years, uh, the International Agency for Research of Cancer in France, in Lyon, where, where I'm presently. And uh, that, that website, they have a lot of material and good uh, hints about uh, cancer registration at every level. So this is a very uh, important tool for better epidemiology on cancer. And so here I come to the end uh, with the, what the very important, uh, the, the, probably uh, another very important uh, aspect of uh, research is protocol writing. Never start any epidemiologic research or whatever research without having a protocol written, even minimal. Uh, that's something uh, very, the protocol is, is a very good way to, uh, uh, to, to address all issues uh, you may have into, uh, uh, for a study and consider the different aspects, uh, even the monetary aspect. And uh, then in the protocol, you have indeed a number of, uh, of, uh, of items. I have tried to, to minimize them on this slide, but these are the main, very important formulation of a study question and objective. Not that easy always. Okay. What exactly you want to do, what exactly you want to bring as a new knowledge. And then we have what we say, the objective must be stated. What, 
what we want to do, who were the patients, where, when, which snapshots with what we call the, the PICO criteria. You will see that often into the, the good journals, they say you have to, to, to uh, phrase all the objectives with PICO, that to say which patient, where, for which disease, how, and so on. So this is something that key crucial is the question and objective, the formulation of the PICO. Then indeed you have the design, uh, the patient selection, the comparison to be made, what are you comparing to what, what is your reference group that say the, the group without uh, an exposure, without the risk, uh, the bias, which one, how you want to avoid them, confounding the same data collection on confounding. And then here, uh, the point A with statistical analysis, I have only two things to say, oh, it's 40 minutes, just say two things. Minimize the statistical test, first of all, try to, uh, I uh, really to try to uh, avoid uh, going in plenty of analysis. The only thing that you will uh, get is plenty of p-values and difficult to interpret. And then be careful on subgroup analysis. The protocol must state exactly what a priori are the subgroup analysis you want to do before end. Okay, and then, uh, yes, then for presenting a bit for the exercises after. In fact, the exercises, I think the, the best thing would be in, uh, when reading uh, some articles to look at whether these articles, you, you understand where are the different bits of, uh, that are important for understanding what has been done uh, in that epidemiology study. Uh, thank you for your attention.